Welcome here everybody to Thursday night. It is nice to see you. Yep. I feel like that was a lame beginning. Wow, was it what other way of saying? Hey everybody, so great of you to join. <laughs> like that, that yeah. works. Okay. Hey everybody, so great of you to join. See, that's perfect. Did you like that? Yeah. <laughs> hey everybody, so great. Wait, I should pause it for a second. <laughs> Why? I wasn't all of this. <laughs> hey everybody, so great of you to join us here tonight on Thursday night. Some of you are sitting on your couches in your living room. Some of you are sitting six feet apart from your small group, which is fantastic. Wherever you are, we're glad that you're mm. here. Yeah. Well, that's it for announcements. <laughs> so we're going to move into Bible reading time. So employer Bibles, we're in John 17. John 17, 1 to 19. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those who have, you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I revealed to you those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave them, me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so the scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am out of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as much I am not of it. Sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. John 17, 1 to 19. Earlier this week, uh, Luke's grandfather passed away in Saskatchewan. It wasn't a surprise, um, and his family was actually grateful that the, the pain was over for him. But whenever we are confronted with the reality of death, it, it causes us to pause. Sometimes we react with grief or, or regret or outrage if the death seemed to be unjust, if the cause was outrageous. And then regardless of, of a person's background or beliefs, the moments before death are considered sacred. I have a good friend who is a nurse and she often works with um, end of life patients and end of life care. And she's told me before the strangeness of being with a person just moments before they slip into eternity to whatever lies behind the curtain of death for them. And none of us know when our last day will be, and often we don't spend lots of time thinking about it. Maybe we've, we've thought, oh, what would I do if I knew I only had 24 hours left? What would I say? Where would I go? For the past several weeks, literally during this entire COVID season, we've been walking our way slowly through Jesus' final conversation with his disciples before he goes to the cross. We know that this is sacred space. 
And, and what Luke has just read for us is even more intimate and more personal as we hear Jesus' prayer to God, his Father, just moments before he's arrested and his suffering begins. What I want us to notice is how incredibly remarkable Jesus' deathbed prayer is. Because that's kind of what it is. It's kind of what it's like. And, and what does it teach us about Jesus' view of suffering and death? And what, what, it, what would it have meant for his disciples and what would it mean for us? See, Jesus knew what was going to unfold in the coming hours. He knew that it would be the darkest moments in all of history as he would be betrayed by his closest friends. He would withstand false accusations thrown at him with no one to speak to his defense. His body would be thrashed by brutal beatings. He would be strapped to wooden beams that he would have to carry through crowds who he loved as they mocked and spit at him. And then he would be nailed to a cross, a, a form of death that was intended to prolong suffering and agony. This is what Jesus knew was coming, and yet this is what he prays. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. His words are amazing. See, for Jesus, suffering and death wasn't unexpected, but it also wasn't a, a, a pitiful end. For him, it was glory. Now, glory for us is standing center stage while crowds scream our names. Glory for us is when you make that shot that wins your team the game and everyone comes off the benches and lift you up. That is glory. So how could this possibly be glory for Jesus? He, he explains it a little bit. If we keep reading, he says, I have brought glory to you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. See, Jesus understood that this is what God had sent him there for. The ministry, the miracles, the life perfectly lived, and the suffering and death that would come. His eyes were set beyond the present moment, trusting in God's greater plan that would last longer than this momentary suffering. This was glory to Jesus. Think for a minute how you and I view death. How do we view suffering? And to be totally honest, how do we even view being uncomfortable? How do we handle losses, frustrations, disappointments, and detours? Life when it doesn't work out the way we wanted it to or thought it should. See, John uh, was one of the disciples who would have been there listening in to this prayer, and he's actually the one who wrote it down for us in this gospel. And what Jesus prays next is actually a prayer specifically for his disciples. What would it have been like to hear Jesus, the Son of God, speak to the, the, the King of the universe on your behalf? And what can we gather from these words about he, how Jesus was inviting his disciples, his closest friends and followers, to respond to what was coming? If you look back over verses 6 to 19, you'll notice that Jesus specifically asks God for three things for his disciples. That they would be protected by the power of his name so that they would be unified. He asked that they would be protected from the evil one and that they would be sanctified. Now, sanctified is just a fancy word that means to be set apart or wholly dedicated to God's purposes. Notice what he doesn't ask. 
Jesus doesn't ask for protection from harm. He doesn't ask for a smooth road ahead for them. What he says in verse 18 is this, as you have sent me into the world, I have sent them. Now think about what this means. God sent his beloved son into the world to show what God was truly like, to reveal his heart for the humanity that he had created. And the pinnacle of his revelation was Jesus's sacrificial death on the cross, which included brutal suffering and torture beforehand. God sent his own son into suffering. And Jesus says, as you have sent me into the world, I have sent them, my disciples, my followers, and all who would follow me after in generations to come. See, all too often, my perspective of suffering and death and even inconvenience when things don't go my way is all too similar to the culture that we live in. It causes me to give in to fear and, and frustration, to hesitate over taking risks. But what would it be like if we actually embraced our Savior's commissioning? What if we were sold out to be set apart for God's purposes? And what if we actually had confidence in this prayer that Jesus prayed, that we knew we would have God's protection, that we would be kept in the power of his name, that we would be, we would be safe from the enemy's purposes? What would this look like? It might look like us having the courage, like a man named John Patton. You may not have heard of him before. He's a missionary who lived over a hundred years ago. See, him and his wife, uh, they were called by God to go to an island that was known for violence and cannibalism. And they felt called to go there and bring the good news of Jesus to them. And as he got there, shortly after arriving, he, he lost his wife and, and his child. And, and in the years that followed, he faced constant threat of death at the hands of these people. At one point, him and a friend were surrounded by these enemies. And this is how he records the scene in his autobiography. He says this, My heart rose up to the Lord Jesus. I saw him watching all the scene. My peace came back to me like a wave from God. I realized that I was immortal till my master's work with me was done. The assurance came to me as if a voice out of heaven had spoken that not a musket would be fired to wound us, not a club would prevail to strike us, not a spear would leave the hand in which it was held vibrating to be thrown, not an arrow would leave the bow or a killing stone the fingers. Without the permission of Jesus Christ, whose is all power in heaven and on earth. Now, this story is not to demonstrate that John Patton is some kind of superhero. You and I have the same access to the assurance, the peace, and the confidence that he had. And Jesus, our Lord and Savior, modeled it for us best when he looked into the face of suffering and death and called it glory. See, Grandpa Friesen, uh, he loved the Lord, and, and when he actually went to be with Jesus, his daughter was with him, and she was reading Psalm 27 to him. And it says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? We are all immortal until our master's work is done for us. Let me pray. Father, I pray that we would understand uh, what this means. 
God, that we would understand that because Christ came and because he was obedient to death on the cross, because he rose again and didn't stay dead, because he now is sitting beside you on his throne, because all of this is true. We have a hope beyond uh, the momentary suffering and frustrations and, and detours of the life that we're in right now. We have a hope beyond that, God, and I pray that this would transform our hearts. God, that we would be um, more confident than, than we're able on our own, that we would be filled with more joy than is, than is possible on our own. God, that you would set our hearts to be fully set apart for your purposes. That you would give us the faith and the courage and the boldness when we need it. All for the sake of your glory and your name. Amen. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us for NHSY Youth Night. I have been your host, Luke Friesen. We, we have been the hosts. The Friesens have been your host. Thank you for joining. See you next.